Oh, hey, Simon, what are you doing here? Uh, well, I thought that we had agreed uh, that we were going to have our podcast today, right? We're going to be uh, interviewing Chad Sanderson from, from Gable. Oh, today. Yeah. So about that. Um, so I changed the date and the time that uh, we're going to talk with him. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't think to make you aware of those changes. Uh, uh, is that a problem? I mean, yes, we, we I thought we had an agreement. I thought uh, I mean, yeah. Why didn't you tell me about this in advance? This is, of course, this is a problem. Oh, you know, I, I didn't realize that you were so dependent on, you know, knowing the, the date. Yeah. And the time. Had, uh, I guess it makes sense now in hindsight, you know, yes. that, that you would probably need to know any changes that I make to that. Absolutely. Um, we had oh, a, 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 I, a contract of sorts. Yeah. I, you know, I see, I see Chad is here with us too now. I, I guess I forgot yeah. to tell him about the changes too. That's right. Gosh, how, how embarrassing. Um, you know, see, this is the, this is the kind of problem that happens when, when someone makes a change without telling the people that are affected by that change. Uh, right? uh, um, I love it. I love that we're tying it in. <laughs> of course. Uh. <laughs> of course, I would never reschedule this without telling you, Simon. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that would be unprofessional. But here's another example. What if you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into building this amazing dashboard, compiling statistics and visualizations about this podcast, about how many followers we have and downloads and locations of listeners and number of shares and you name it, everything is on there. And you know, you're pulling this data from our, our podcast hosting provider. And, and then one day out of the blue, I decide to just up and change podcast hosts without telling you. And uh, you log into your beautiful dashboard one day and all you see are a bunch of boxes of errors where no data is able to be returned. You feel like this be... is, by the way, this is a little too close to home. This has actually happened to me in a business <laughs> setting before. So I, I'm, I, yes, I, this might, yeah, this I'm feeling, be... I'm having flashbacks. It's horrible. I, I could be possibly triggering some people right now. Yes. Um, especially people with, with uh, Looker Studio, you know, I, yeah. I remember <laughs> GA4 with the quota limits, all that. Anyway, uh, a little off topic. So yeah, if, if I did that, you'd be devastated, probably a little angry with me. And Absolutely. Really so. Um, but you know, this kind of thing happens all the times in companies, right? Developers and software engineers who work on products make changes that alter the data that the product produces, right? And they may not have any bad intentions. They may just be, you know, making tweaks and changes to improve some functionality of the product without realizing that the downstream data is changing along with it. But it affects the analysts, the data scientists, the machine learning engineers whose lifeblood is that data. Of course, we can't make good decisions without good data whether those be decisions about pricing models or marketing budgets or website performance, right? Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. But how do we ensure the data quality? Well, to help us answer this question, we're lucky to be joined by Chad Sanderson today. Chad is the CEO and co-founder of Gable, a startup that some have called the GitHub for Data, a collaboration, communication, and change management platform for data teams. He is truly passionate about data quality, speaking at conferences, writing with writing the data product substack, where he discusses data product development, semantic layers, data APIs, modern data modeling, and a whole bunch about data contracts, which we're going to be diving into today. And uh, one of my favorite things, uh, he operates a Slack group called the Data Quality Camp Slack Group. Um, I, I like Slack, gr Slack groups. Um, I have like a dozen of them on the on the side of my my uh, Slack app, which drives some people crazy to be involved in so many Slacks. But let's, I, th I feel like that's a thing now. So I love I love a good Slack group. And with that, welcome to the Measure Up Podcast, Chad. Great. Well, what an intro. Uh, thank you for having me. That was <laughs> I had to throw in some sound effects. Absolutely. We've got a live audience here today. <laughs> yes. Very sad to see Chad. But Chad, tell us about yourself. Obviously, got some info there from, from Jim, but we'd love to hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you, to, uh, Jim, for that uh, incredible intro, like I said. But uh, a bit about me. I am the CEO of Gable. Prior to that, I ran the data platform, data engineering, and data governance team at a late-stage freight technology company called uh, Convoy. Um, before that, I worked on the AI platform team at Microsoft, which has gotten significantly more famous in the last six to eight months. And um, before that, I've run data both on the analytics side and the experimentation side for companies like Sephora and Subway and uh, Oracle and, and, and places like this. So I've been in data a pretty long time. I actually started on the marketing side of things and then gradually moved towards infrastructure once I realized that I, in, in order to ensure data quality, I had to do so from uh, more of a foundational uh, 
uh, code oriented level. And then I started uh, finding all the skeletons in the closet and I, I haven't, haven't exited since. <laughs> the, 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 it's a large closet. It a is. A lot of skeletons. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like Narnia in there. I think you just, yeah. fall, you fall into it and you go, okay, there's a, a lot of things going on, but, but it, it, it's such a, uh, such a catalytic moment right now in terms of, you know, we're, we're on this, we're on the precipice of, of what folks are framing as the, the, AI, the AI revolution. And a lot of that is predicated on having data that you can actually use for, for analysis. But the challenge, I think a lot of, you know, if, if data is the new oil, then there's this idea that, well, oil still needs refinement. And there's lots of different byproducts that come out of that. And it certainly seems like that's the intersection that, that, you, that you have uh, recognized and that you are really leading leading the pulse on. Um, and as we, as we dive in here, um, you know, for, for a lot of our listeners, they're focused really on the data utilization side of the house. Uh, but really to get to the point of utilization, you got to have an incredibly strong foundation and, and, and have that um, all, all, you know, in ship shape. So with that, I think before we go too far, we'd love to just dive into well, what, what are the challenges with that modern data life cycle, the, you know, the, the modern data stack? Yeah. So maybe a, a, small amount of context um the modern data stack is a um it refers to a set of tools in you know the 2020s these are cloud-based data vendors and essentially it allows you to set up a data infrastructure soup to nuts mm. um, where do we store the data uh, how do we move the data? How do we transform the data? How do we schedule the data arriving and doing different things in our data ecosystem? How do we analyze the data and so on and so forth? And all these tools kind of need to be strung together and connected to form a stack. And there are lots of these. There's a guy named Matt Turk, who's a venture capitalist with a, a firm called Firstmark. And every year he puts together this report called the MAD Data Stack. And the, that list just gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Back in 2014, I think he started it. It was like five companies or something. Sure. And now it's hundreds, hundreds of companies. And this is, this is great, right? It's, it, it's, it's actually good that infrastructure exists. It's good that um, data tooling exists. It gives people a lot of choices. But number one, I find people can fall prey to analysis paralysis, right? Like if you have so many options, it's hard to figure out what is actually right for you. And it can mm -hmm. lead to shiny object syndrome where you're kind of chasing the things that sound very cool on paper without making sure that, like you mentioned, you, you've actually gotten your foundations and your house in order uh, first. That, that's number one. That's one big problem. The second big problem is when we all decided to move to the cloud, and this was an exciting thing because especially in the data world, you know, because it got it got way cheaper. We separated compute and storage. We left those on-prem databases and servers and managing all of this, you know, in a big uh, warehouse or something. We moved that up into the cloud. We don't have to deal with that anymore. It's it's way less expensive. It's way faster. Um, but we left behind a lot of the governance models that really were required for an on-prem data system to work. If it's extremely expensive to store and move data, you have to be very thoughtful about what data you collect and how it's organized and who's responsible for it. So you had this guy who was like, or, or a girl who was a data architect, and they thought about these things. They thought about, well, how should the data be organized? And what does the business actually need? And what are the key entities and events that we should collect? And how should they be strung together? And they in actually, this new world- had, about, yeah. Yeah, they actually had ERDs and, and star ERDs. schemas and defined data tables and yeah. Exactly. Like you you had all of this, you know, really amazing uh, process and, and structure. And when we go to the cloud, now it's all about decoupling and decentralization and mm. no more central planning. So ERD poof, out the window <laughs> and data architecture poof, out the window. And that, and that leaves um, data consumers and analysts in kind of a tough spot. And the, I mean, you, it even shows in some of the terminology that we use, right? Like data lakes. Oh, just throw it in the data lake. And yeah. the lake becomes a swamp because it's all a bunch of garbage data that no one knows <laughs> what to do with and no one knows what it is to begin with or how it was collected or what it means. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Terrible for the resale uh, value in your uh, data lake house. <laughs> they, I think that's what Snowflake's been talking about a lot lately. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, there's... um. It, and and it, you can see kind of why this stuff happened, right? Like the, the reason why is because it's gotten so easy for a software engineer to just say, look, I am going to emit every single piece of data that I create from my service to a data lake. And then I don't have to think about it anymore. 
Yeah. I don't have to worry about the data model. I don't have to create an ERD. I don't have to build a design. I don't have to move slowly and, and you know, follow all the governance practices at the organization. I can move as fast as I want. And those data people who I don't know and don't really talk to, they will figure out how to create this amazing model. And they'll stitch together all the trash into something beautiful. But like Jim, you said at the very beginning, garbage in, garbage out, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... You know, there were, there were even some analytics tools in the past that sort of um, pushed this concept of just track everything. And, you know, raise your hand if you've ever had a client that, you know, tracked literally every single click on the page, whether it was a link or not, like literally clicks on the background. Yeah. Got tracked. Isn't that the entire with, premise of high touch still? Oh, no, 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 not high touch. Sorry. Uh, uh, heap. Heap. I think. Yeah. I, I mean, just that was lives one in I was the era about. of, yeah, yeah it tracked everything. Wanna, even if you I don't didn't want to name names, Simon, but yeah. Well, geez. I'm not throwing them under the bus. I'm just saying it is an approach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and honestly, yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, I could, if I thought long enough, I could probably steal man an argument uh, yeah. for that too, but yeah. it does have other consequences, right? Well, yeah. I, and, and I, I think this, a, a lot of this comes down to a, a, trying to apply a software engineering mentality to data one-to-one. Mm. And it, it turns out like software engineers think about things very differently than, than, than data people do. As a software engineer, your goal is to build something functional, right? That's like the end result of all this stuff. I'm going to go out, write some code. That code has never existed in the world. And my end output is an app that does a thing. But in the data world, like our primary, the primary function of data is to tell the truth about the world. Like we need useful, relevant, contextual information. And then we can use that data to do something functional, like a machine learning model, or we can use it to do something analytical, like a dashboard or a report. But the core atomic unit of value is actually trust. And those are very different incentives. So when your primary incentive is to just produce something functional and to make sure it's flexible and you can experiment rapidly, you're going to organize your business so that you can move as fast as you possibly can. But when your primary unit of value is trust, it's going to require more conversation and more centralization and more mm. governance to decide on which one of these entities is like actually our definition of customer. And these, these things are sometimes at odds with each other. Yeah, I imagine too, like especially like the the stage of the company, right? When you're when you're a brand new company, your startup, you want to move fast. You don't want to be encumbered by all of these decisions that you have to make to make sure it's robust and going to last long. And, and that makes complete sense, uh, and I get that. But then at a certain point, you get this. You know, we talk about tech debt. I'm, I don't know if data debt is a term yet, but if it's not, I just coined it. Um, <laughs> you know, same thing, right? You're going to have a bunch of data debt that's going to have to get cleaned up at some point. And eventually you have to move to a system where it is more thoughtful. It is more uh, designed around here's what we're trying to do and accomplish. And here's, here's the goals of the, of what we want to do with the data. Yeah. I mean, uh, number one, I, I think you're right. It, like if the term doesn't exist, it, it, it should. Um, and I, I think data debt is, is different and worse than tech debt, right? Mm. Like w- when I think about tech debt, it's stuff it's, it's these short-term decisions that we know we're going to have to pay back later. And if we don't, it may result in us going slower. So I kind of imagine it like a swamp that gets deeper and deeper the further you wade into it. And the deeper the swamp is, the harder it is to move. Whereas data debt is almost like a decision to use untrustworthy data because we have to move quickly. We know the data doesn't actually represent the truth, but we have to use what we can because we don't have anything else and our executive just wants a dashboard or something like that. Mm -hmm. That is not the same as going slow. That's almost like taking a little bit of poison in your soup, right? I know that it's going to (laughs) hurt me. It's going to make me feel bad. But as long as it's a little bit, I'm only going to be a little bit sick. But the more poison you add over time, eventually you get to the point where you're just eating poison and you're dying. And I think that that's what's happening to a lot of data teams, right? Like the data infrastructure is so poisoned with incorrect information that you're actually not able to make a good decision. And and like you said earlier, it leads to an environment of distrust, right? Where no one trusts the data. And that's hard to build back from, right? That's that's a, a company culture that is takes time to build that trust back up. Yeah. And for, for, for what it's worth, uh, the term uh, data debt, I just did a, a quick search. It looks like it was perhaps first coined in 2020. So um, oh. it, it, it is a construct out there in the in the, in the the ecosystem, um, but it's still very immature in, in, a, in its sort of, a, like when you say tech debt, I think everyone, even non, 
even a lot of non-technical folks know what you're referencing. But data did, I think, is a is is still in its infancy in here, and and that perhaps is something that we need to all become a lot more aware of, um, and because it's sort of it, it lives in the shadows. And it's not about speed. I think this is the core difference, right? Tech debt is all about slowing. Like that's sort of the engineering. Yeah. The, the biggest thing for an engineer is you are slowing me down, right? I need to be able to ship fast. And the reason I need to be able to ship fast is because I don't know that these features are going to work. That means I need to get it in front of a customer as soon as I can to validate that the feature is valuable to them. If you're slowing me down, it means I can't ship as many features, meaning I can't iterate fast enough. But data is, is not about that. It's The data debt is not about speed. It is about trust. That's a very, very different concept. And I think it's one that honestly, software engineers have a hard time wrapping their heads around sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot of elements here of um, not just like the data quality, but like the, the data redundancy, even just that the, just as, do we even use this? What, who even created this? What, what was that? Uh, there was a meme going around a, a while ago. It's like, hey, pull me this report. And it's like, sure. Uh, then the sequel is like from perfect table that doesn't even exist. Uh, and that's <laughs> it's sort of the reality of, of the modern uh, analyst life cycles going out there and just trying to go back into the forest that no one has been maintaining and, and, and to try, try and find something that even resembles what they need. And they bring that back. and It's a one-time use. That is a very real challenge. Um, I'd love to, I mean, are there other challenges that we're not thinking about here that are, that are created by some of the, the pieces that we're talking about? I think there's a, quite a few, actually. I mean, the, the core of all of this, honestly, is, is, is what we've been discussing, which is that like, I think that companies have started to bifurcate their, technical components. Mm. So in the old, in the 70s and 80s, there really was no software engineering team. Uh, there was just the tech team. Sure. And the tech team thought about data and they thought about software and they usually thought about those things together. And oftentimes data was the first thing that these teams thought about because there wasn't such thing as like the cloud or an application engineer or something like that. But once you see the rise of these software companies like Amazon and you know Facebook and Microsoft, now this idea of a software engineer, like someone who is specifically focused on creating applications and services and experimenting on them, that starts to become its own separate role. And the data engineer mm. and the data team starts to become its own separate thing as well. Yeah. And now like these two teams that used to be one yeah. have become two. And that actually creates some weird dynamics because all of the all of the data that the data team needs is coming from the engineering team right, right? you can't you can't get it any other way it, it yeah. might be by you know hooking up salesforce it might be by some like um, you know, point of sales thing. It might be, you know, a transactional database, but some somehow or another, some engineering related person has to set up all this data stuff for their application. And now the data teams are kind of reusing it. So it's sort of like this game of, I, I wouldn't say hot potato, but I'm like, hey, I'm a software engineer. I'm producing some data. It's useful to me. You can have it if you want, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to care about you. I'm not yeah. going to think about that use case. It's all on you to figure out. And if I decide to change the way that I'm storing that data, you just have to suffer the consequences of that because I'm kind of king of the castle here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the realities of living downstream. If you're if you're the, you know you got a farm downstream and someone decides we're going to put a dam in up here and we're going to oh I don't know we're going to pollute the water in some capacity so it's good for us but yeah you know, by the time it gets to you it's it's non uh, you know can't use for irrigation that then. What do you do? You have to, you know, I don't know, create your own uh, water purification plant or something, right? The, the, it, it creates a secondary issue. And un, it, perhaps, even, yeah, like you said, unattended. None of this is through malice. It's just through that's not my job or, or the, I'm not even thinking about your your particular use cases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, so like, you know, lack of ownership, right, is, is one of the big issues. Um, are there, like, like Simon was mentioning, are there other things that kind of contribute to this um, kind of culture of the the software again it's not that the software engineers are evil <laughs> or have any bad intents it's just that that's that's not their job right and i don't mean that derog in a derogatory way it's literally it's just that's not their focus they're they're creating features and creating products and you know we can't add another job onto their plate of oh and by the way you also are now responsible for creating well manicured data for this other team, right? Uh, do, do you see, are there, is, is this possibly a new role that would evolve into? Like, do companies have software engineers where this is their core functionality or their core role? 
I think that we're going to start to see more of that. At the absolute least, we will begin to see a lot of experimentation around um, job titles and functions. Mm. The and 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 I don't think that data is the um, kind of redheaded stepchild here that's doing something unique. I, I think we're starting to see this sort of consolidation of roles across all of technology. So in product, product is a great example of this. Airbnb recently said they got rid of every product manager. I don't know if you saw Brian Chesky make that announcement, however long ago it was. But that wasn't really true. What they actually did was they got rid of what we would, what most people would probably consider a TPM, which is sort of like a, a project manager. And they also got rid of their product marketers and they combined all of these into a single role. Someone mm. who's thinking about the the you know the deliverables of the of the project and the product the actual product requirements and the marketing for that product right because it sort of makes sense if you're the one that's creating a product aren't you also the one that is best equipped to like write the messaging for that product as well you understand the customer better than anyone else and engineers have been doing this for a while they call it full stack engineering where you're thinking about both the back end and the front end kind of makes a lot of sense because if you're producing the back end you probably have the best understanding of how to use the api on the front end um and, and I, I think we're going to see consolidation like that in the data world as well, where you'll be like a full stack data engineer. In addition to writing the back end and creating the database, you're also thinking about how this data might get used downstream for machine learning and analytics, and you'll be accountable for that um, in end to end. Um, I, I heard this the other day, um, this, this analogy of like farm to table. Mm. Um, and I think that's super relevant in data because data is a lot more like a supply chain than an application. You've got something mm. that's being created at the source and it goes through many different steps of transformation and movement. And then it arrives at its destination where it has to be curated and provided to the eventual customer. And there needs to be full visibility. So in addition to the ownership, the visibility of that pipeline, I think is just as essential. Is that a um, not to uh, you know try and poo poo on that, but is that is that a realistic role that a lot of folks at this moment in time are able to handle? And I I guess I, I'm I'm thinking this through in terms of the depth of knowledge that I know certain folks have that I've worked with over the years and sort of where they really lean in on certain areas. And sometimes it's very hard for someone who is so technically astute to speak to the value of what they they have in I guess layman's terms because they just sit on a higher plane and there's a, a, an assumption of knowledge. And so you basically have to cross train these individuals to be really good at all these different things. And that's sort of something that over the years we've been maybe moving away from a little bit because we realize how deep and how challenging some of these areas are in particular. Like, do, do you see this as a, as a core skill set that a lot of folks have right now? Or is it something that we as an industry are really going to have to, uh, uh, I don't know, find ways to cross train and adapt toward? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think that literacy and data literacy uh, needs to improve yeah. significantly before we can even start going down this path. And ultimately, I don't think it will be um, one person's responsibility to own everything. I think it will be more like handoffs. Mm. So I, as a software engineer, you know, I'm responsible for creating like, you know, um, I, I, I'm responsible for the logging. I'm responsible for implementing the events. I'm responsible for the database. But my customers become more than just uh, the people using my application. It's also my data scientists. It's also my analysts. It's also my you know marketing team that's using the data. So I'm it's it's less of like doing everything related to the data mm. and more so of who I consider a customer. Um, and I think that has to begin with awareness, right? Like. Mm. This is the same, um, I think it follows the same principles as, as Agile, you know, like back in the early 2000s, uh, I think it was like 2008 or something like that, you had the Agile Manifesto come out and yep. everybody started talking about, we need to move away from waterfall software development because it takes way too long and it's way too slow and you can only ship every six months and that's just not acceptable and blah, 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 blah. And there were these 14 points that everybody needed to follow. And if you went to businesses at that point in time and you went to engineers and asked them about Agile, they would laugh at you. Like, like, okay, yeah, you want me to ship every single day? Explain how exactly I'm supposed to do that and then I'll right. start to take you seriously, right? And then what came along was version control. And version control absolutely changed everything because it turns out shipping iteratively is really, really good 
for software engineers. It means mm-hmm. I don't have to stake my entire reputation on like a release that takes me seven or eight months to put together. And if yeah. one thing goes wrong, I'm screwed. Now I can start to release more iteratively. And if anything is wrong, I can just roll it back and fix yeah. it and cause minimal damage. So version control came around and that was exceptionally useful. And it got a lot of adoption because it added value. And then at some point, the engineer said, okay, well, now we're all living in this world where we're shipping every single day. What is a better system of managing like which projects we work on? Because this mm. old world of shipping every six months and planning out six months, that doesn't work when we're shipping every day anymore. I need better, right. more direction. And boom, Agile suddenly has purpose and it has value. And I, I think something very similar is going to happen here. Once mm. the capabilities to take ownership and to be aware of how other people are using your data actually exist, then all these great new processes around like data ownership and data management from the top will, will actually serve a purpose. Yeah. So, well, and, and I think, you know, it's not quite the same, I don't think, but it, it, it serves as a, um, a, a good uh, segue into something that you are incredibly um, prolific about uh, writing about. Obviously, it's, it's what you've seen the uh, greatest opportunity in with, within the data space, and that is the concept of data contracts. Um, so for the folks who are listening to this and they go, I don't know what a data, I know what a contract is, I know what data is, I don't know what a data contract is. What is it? What's, what's the core idea here and what, what are you trying to solve with it? So a, a contract is not a legal document. It no. is a, or a data contract is not a legal document anyway. Um, it is the equivalent of an API. Mm. It's an agreement between a data producer and a data consumer on what data should be vended, what should its structure be, and what is the expectations of that data. So in the software engineering world, the way that um, different engineering teams and customers communicate with each other is through an interface. And that interface is the API. And that API is designed explicitly for the purpose of communication, right? I'm building out an interface that other people can access, and I agree to give them very specific information through that interface. In the data world, we don't really have any of those agreements in place. Data just kind of exists, and we can go in and access it, and we can start to use it. But I haven't subscribed to anything. There is no agreement. There's no interface that a producer has explicitly said, I am going to maintain this and, ma- and maintain right. it in- into the future. And that's the purpose that the data contract serves. Well, maybe there's like a, a verbal agreement to it, right? But in th- maybe there's, there's, there's no agreement. enforcement of these things. There's no actually checks and balances associated with it. So I guess where in the... D- you know, we talked a lot about these these companies that start, and I think it's true for for most organizations when they when they start working and they they are taking sh- maybe some shortcuts, and they're just like, let's just get some data here. We've, we've got these tables. We, we, we'll ha- you know we'll have a few data silos, but you know that's their infrastructure today. Where in this journey would the data contract fit? How do they bring this into their stack currently? Yeah, so I I think today where we're seeing a lot of interest in the data contract is growth stage companies that are starting to rapidly mature. They found really meaningful and important use cases for data, but they lack any sort of communication structure or change management structure um, to evolve that data over time. Mm. And they're beginning to see breakdowns in that process and it's costing them real money. Uh, we also see a lot of interest in it from the big kind of enterprisey uh, companies out there that have 40 or 50 or 60 different data products that are extraordinarily useful. And they may have hundreds of different data producers and thousands of different data systems. And for them, the, the, the problem is more about managing all the complexity mm. and you know, trying to create some order, like a, some subset of this complexity that we can sort of focus on and, and start to optimize for. So I don't think it really exists in the startup companies, to your point. The mm. focus is much more around building those MVPs and just getting something out there. But shortly after that, I think right. the need for the contract starts to emerge. Yeah, well, and, and that's such a... It, it's a hard moment for so many companies because uh, the first time you see something that you're like, oh, well, what does what does make do? We'll just we, we'll work around it. Like you know, it's, it's sort of like how long does it take to break that camel's back? Um, and, and by then maybe it's too late. And so it, it does seem one of those things that needs to be um, integrated in from a, a much earlier point, or at least the the idea of this needs to be integrated in. Um, and, and I guess one question I would have there is just you know uh, why 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 aren't we seeing this kind of innovation coming out of like BigQuery, for example? 
Yeah, well, I, I think there's a there's a few reasons for that. Um, BigQuery is great. Um, Redshift is great. Snowflake, all of these companies are great, but they focus really exclusively on the analytical database where queries are being written. And generally, when you have a lot of queries being written in an analytical database, um, you can kind of figure out who's using stuff through data lineage, right? Mm. I can look at SQL, I can parse that SQL out, I can figure out where it's coming from. And so there is some awareness of like where changes are happening and stuff like that. I wouldn't say it's very well understood. Contracts are definitely needed there as well. But the amount of problems and the number of, of data quality issues um, are the, the 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 largest amount of data quality issues are primarily coming from primarily coming from the source data systems. Mm, so mm. These are the engineers that are maintaining like the Google Analytics events or the Amplitude sure. events or the Mixpanel events, or they own the databases, or it's somebody doing work in Salesforce, or it's like it's someone up there yeah. that is. There's this big gap, this kind of like chasm in yeah. between people who are like writing code or producing data and people who are actually using that data. And the further sure. away that you get, the bigger the problem becomes. Yeah. So, it's, you know, yeah, big queries, your supermarket in this regard, but how is the food getting into that supermarket yes. and where, where all the, where, where's the butcher getting all the stuff from and, and, and having the, that, that line of sight? Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, Jim, I, I see you, you look pensive. I, I just, I'm. Sorry, it's completely off topic, but you just come up with the best analogies off the top of your head. Like, oh, it's like a supermarket. I'm like, yeah, it is like a supermarket. Why didn't I think of that? No. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was just, uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking out loud, thinking not out loud, I guess, quietly thinking about um, just, yeah, the, the difference between sort of changes at the source versus, okay, the data's in Azure, Snowflake, or BigQuery, and now there are changes happening to it. Like you said, uh, you know, you mentioned there are, there are ways to understand the problems there as well, right? So if you're doing, you know, if you're using DBT and, and some other tools to keep track of changes that are made, you have the data lineage features built in there. Are, are there other, like, is, are there other ways that we, you know, that, that data quality is at risk there that are maybe less, people are less aware of? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that anytime you've got code um, doing anything in your data ecosystem, Unless it is easily interpretable by others what that code is doing, you are at risk of something changing, whether it's the code itself or the business changing. So I'll give you an example of this. When I was at Convoy, um, pretty early in Convoy's history, we had uh, a query that was written about uh, it was like figuring out which shipments should go should be fed into our pricing model. And uh, at that point in time, Convoy didn't really focus on long haul shipments. It was like shipments over a few hundred miles or a thousand miles or something like that, um, just outside of our scope. But at some point, it was it was within our scope. Now, that initial query was actually excluding a lot of the shipment data that we were getting for those mm. long haul shipments. But all of a sudden, the business decided, no, 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 we're actually going to start taking those shipments now. So they went to the engineering team. They said, we're going to start taking those shipments. We're going to put a new process in place. We're going to have new pricing in place. But that one little query, that tiny line of code that existed in the data warehouse that was powering the model wasn't actually updated. And so all of a sudden, we were like, wait, hold on a second. Why, why, are, why, why are we not pricing these shipments? Why are we losing money on these shipments? And it was because like four years ago, a data scientist had written a single line of code that had never been documented and nobody else knew was there. Uh, and these are the types of problems that I think are like rife in any data environment. They're everywhere. Wow. Uh, I mean, this and this is this is a this is, you know it's rife. It's 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 incredibly complicated. How can if folks are listening to this going, yeah, I know we've got a bunch of problems, but you know that sounds like a smoking gun scenario where there is a fin a direct financial impact on the bottom line immediately. But how can folks be thinking about this in their organization to make the case that look, everything we do right now with data is already very expensive. There's a lot of money that is tied up in all of these things that we're building, all this processing. Um, I want to add in more cost by doing this thing. Uh, and, you know, you can make the case that like, look, long term, it's actually going to save you money. But how do you go about that process? How do you start that conversation to go in and, and maybe find these areas or find the the gaps or the unknowns in, in your space to make the case to your, your, your seniors? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So what I like to compare um, data contracts and, you know, really good preventative data quality policies to is home security. 
Mm. Right. So if I've got, I've, I've got a house, my house is full of valuable stuff. I've got yep. jewels, I've got electronics. Um, it's, and, and let, let's say that my house is getting burgled yeah. uh, every Wednesday or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. that. That's, that's really bad for me. And so if I wanted to justify a home security system, I would just look at the cost of the things being stolen from my house. And mm. I think this is what data professionals need to do as well. Like if data quality is an issue for you, then you need to find those use cases where changes, problems to your data quality are causing the financial impact, mm. right? Like So in the case of that machine learning model that I mentioned, um, there was a real financial impact that was caused by there not being uh, data contracts and not having data quality at the source, which is we are trying to price a, a collection of shipments that we should be making money on, but we are losing money on those. So I can actually identify down to the row level how much a single piece of bad data is going to cost me. Or I could go the opposite way and say, I can identify how expensive this query is for us because um, it's filtering out X number of shipments. And that's a motivation mm. to go in and fix all these things. So I think starting from the bottom at Convoy, we call these our tier one data services. So this mm. is like, what are the applications of data that are ha already having a business value? And, and then quantifying what the impact of a data quality issue would be on that artifact. I, I love that idea, that the, this idea of, and it's probably not new to a lot of folks, but this uh, hierarchical stratification of uh, um, data um, solutions that you have with, within your organization. Um, could you speak more like, so tier one, how, how are you defining that? What are the tiers that you have? Because uh, I think that that could be a good model for folks to go out there and I guess sharing my own duty laundry, I don't have a tier structure right now. So <laughs> I'm just even thinking about myself, like, how should I go out and do this? Yeah. No tier structure, yeah. just tiers. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Just tiers, yeah. We um, so the the way that I always thought about it is is we had three tiers: tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, tier one was anything that had a customer facing impact or a direct financial impact on the company uh, if that data was wrong. So um, we had machine learning models. If these machine learning models were low quality, we can literally identify how that loses us money. Um, we also have financial data. That financial data gets audited. If that data is wrong, it's a really, really big problem for the business. Mm. It would fit under tier one as well. Um, another, uh, so tier two is what we would say is like, there are really important decisions being made on this data, but it's kind of hard to identify exactly what the ROI of this data set is, but we still need it to be highly accurate. So a good example would be like a dashboard that the CEO uses every single day to like understand the state of the business and make decisions. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard to quantify, but everybody who uses that data set would acknowledge as like, it's essential for this to be trustworthy. Sure. And then tier three is something where we're okay with a level of directionality. So if we're mm. off by 10% or 20%, um, it, it's not the biggest deal in the world. Obviously, it's, it's preferable if we have 100% accurate data, but if we don't, it's not gonna kill us. A good example of that is, let's say I run some A-B test on a new feature, and I wanna see like how are people clicking buttons on a new filter that I added. It's like, yeah. If, if my data is wrong and people are clicking buttons differently than how they actually are in real life, like, do I really lose anything substantial? I might make an incorrect decision on, of like whether or not to keep that filter, but it's probably not going to kill me. So I like d dividing things up in these three tiers and then finding stakeholders at the business whose data products, like the data assets that they kind of maintain and own and care about fit into those tiers. Um, and then for each one of them, there's different standards of protection and quality. So the tier one stuff, that gets the data contracts right away. You're able to communicate the value of the data contract to everybody in the pipeline. Hey, software engineer, we're not asking you to take ownership of this data for just some random reason because we're crazy marketers or crazy analysts and we're asking you to do a whole bunch of work. It's because this data set is powering something that is actually critical to the business and we need you to do this. And that's a very easy case to make to an executive. Whereas the tier two stuff is more about having the conversation. So mm. you want to bring people together if changes occur and, and, and you're really focused around awareness. Hey, software engineer, I'm not going to prevent you 
from making changes to this thing, but you should be aware that it exists. And mm -hmm. downstream team, you should go and talk to them and figure out a plan moving forward. And the tier three stuff is probably things that we don't want to slow down the software engineers for, but we do want to inform the users of that data that something is coming. Hey guys, a change is going to happen. Now is probably the time to update your queries. Mm. Mm. It's like on the level of a, a change log. Hey, here's what changed or here's what's changing soon. Exactly. We don't have any control over it, but we thought it would be nice to let you know. Yes, absolutely. Uh, kind of like when when uh, Google Analytics uh, the, the export to BigQuery changes, and they're like, "Oh, hey guys, the reason your your query just broke was because we added a new column." Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. Which I think it's happened <laughs> four or five times this year. Yeah, uh, which is always exciting. <laughs> so one of the questions I had, um, and this I guess maybe gets back to a question that that Simon asked at the start when we were talking about data contracts, is is I guess more about the 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 implementation of them or the enforcement of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds like a big part of it is just it's um, it's people management and change management and getting people to communicate. Yes. But you also kind of talked about like thinking about it like a like an API. Is there a data API concept or is it really just a an agreement between parties that, hey, we're going to consult with you before we make any changes. We kind of agree to this on paper. Um, and we're all aware of that, uh, because I, I could see the problem being, you know, as people leave companies or are laid off and it could just kind of wreck that whole process. So I'm, I'm curious, is there actually like a, a te technical enforcement mechanism or is it more of a, just making sure that there's ease of communication between the parties? I think it's I think it's everything. I think it is the the in fact the way I've defined the contract in the past is number one is the creation of the API spec, which is how do I use this data, which is different from documentation, right? Documentation is kind of like describing what the API is and mm. what all the values and variables mean, whereas the spec is saying like this is actually the the way you call this API. Um, so I think it is a it is a spec plus some mechanism of enforcement. And my framing has always been that the data contract itself, the spec should be technology agnostic. It should just describe the data irrespective of where that data is actually stored or how uh, it's moved between systems, but it is the enforcement that is technology specific. And depending on the maturity of the company, you may have uh, more or less uh, types of enforcement. So the, the least mature mechanism of enforcement is to your point, just a person keeping all this stuff in their head and hopefully remembering to do the right thing. I would say the next level of enforcement is, um, is, is CICD. So you're actually inserting yourself into the developer path. You're looking at how a, a change made to that data or uh, how a change made to the code is going to impact the data contract, whether it's going to be backwards incompatible or, or break it or not. And then I would say that there's more advanced versions of that, but you can think of like, as you layer additional constraints onto the contract, there may be many ways to enforce it. Maybe I want to look at the distribution of data over time. Um, if I do that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to need that data content to exist somewhere. Maybe it should land in, in something like a big query and then I can do a profile of the data. And if it doesn't meet my, my constraint or my contract, that's information that goes back to the producer, but it, it does come down to the agreement. So someone has to acknowledge this, like, yes, this is a constraint that we accept and we are willing to take. And I think that's where the discussion uh, comes into play. That's that's the back and forth, and it's it's very similar to to the evolution of an API. Like if a customer needs um, some new property of that API, then they're going to say, "Hey, I've I've got a new request for a feature." Um, but I think in in the data world, because we've got lineage and because we've got all, all of the all of this is very tightly um, interconnected, um, we can do better than that. Right. So someone who's actually using data can literally just say, hey, I've got this column. I'm creating this column to represent an active customers or whatever. So I need some automated system to figure out what are the requirements on my upstream data and how should that represent be represented as a contract. So there's a long sort of tail of maturity 
in terms of implementing uh, programmatic solutions. But I mm. think the best starting point is just to figure out what are your data products and what are the expectations and needs of those data products? And does the upstream team that's generating that data know what those expectations are? And then you can start to layer on the, the, the programmatic enforcement from there. Yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. like there's no no world where that extra awareness and communication doesn't help, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. if that's all you have, okay, that's a start. Um, the, the programmatic enforcement and, and this mechanisms certainly would uh, probably make it easier, but you still need, yeah, you still need people to be aware and, and communicate. And and just is that exactly what Gable.ai does for folks? Just I know we talk a lot about the theory and practice implementation, but I think. Uh, uh, it still can be nebulous for folks of like, what exactly if I, you know, join the, join the waitlist with Gable, what, what exactly does that do? Yeah. I mean, it, that's, that's basically the idea is yeah. what we let someone do is use our platform to create a contract, like some expectation of the data to set up the constraints. And then we will connect to a software engineer's developer environment. We will mm. figure out when that data is going to change by looking at the code. Mm -hmm. And then before the change is actually made, we can compare what the new output of that code mm. is going to be against the contract. And if those two things don't match, we can stop them before anything happens. So we're, we're doing yeah. this right now for events like segment events where we're literally like looking for the event string in the, the pull request and saying like, hey, we, we've detected that this particular event that someone downstream really cares about is about to be changed, then we can figure out what those changes are, compare that to the contract and say, hey, this, this is not allowed because there's an analytics manager somewhere downstream that's using this and you need to go talk to them first. That is, so I just, I, I thought of another sort of uh, similar uh, types of business um, on the web analytics space. Like this is very similar to what you would do with an, like an observe point or uh, a data true where you have web analytics implementations um, code implemented on the site and these tools go and crawl and make sure that you're still tracking the right things and that the values are within an expected range or, you know, it's, it's very mm -hmm. similar to that in a, in a sense. So uh, another way of thinking about it. But, yeah. I was even thinking about it in, in terms of like, uh, well, I used to work in the enterprise software, uh, enterprise content management uh, software world. And there was something called volume check sums, uh, which is tied into government retention schedules. Basically, was this document changed? Did you did you do something illegal here? And can that can you be alerted on uh, the, these documentation changes that again are so far away from the end user? Uh, but that way, you you maintain the integrity of any, anything that happens downstream, or anyone who's viewing it later on. You're like, this was not modified, or this was modified, and and here's how it, it impacted your output. So, yeah, yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I mean, so in the software engineering world, and this is why you know a lot of folks have said, oh, this is like GitHub. Yeah. Because GitHub, like when you think about what it is at the core, it is a change management system for code. Right. Um, it lets you make changes to code in an easy, seamless way. It does integration yep. tests. Like the whole concept of a pull request is just change management. I'm yeah. just asking someone to review my code and make yeah. sure that everything's okay. But that doesn't really, that concept doesn't really exist for data because code has to be translated into the impact of data. You can't just yeah. look at like a 300 line C sharp file. And from that, infer how your downstream dashboards are going to get, be affected. Yeah. Um, and that's effectively what we're doing. We are doing that translation of yeah. code to data and then helping the data teams understand when they're going to be impacted by something. Interesting. Yeah. That's really and, awesome. I mean, uh, look, I think, Chad, we could talk to you for hours about this. Um, and there were so many topics that we were bouncing around that, hey, should we talk about this uh, beforehand? And I feel like we've only really been able to scratch the surface here. But um, as we think about the, the the future of the modern data stack, I think that, you know, that's where we started our conversation today. Um, where, where do you see things evolving? Do you, do you see AI coming in in, in, in any meaningful way, in, in a, I guess, practical way uh, moving forward? Like, what does that look like as you think about the next few years of, of, uh, of data? So my, my thesis here is, I, I, and I think that AI accelerates this substantially, mm. um, is that I, I think quality and ownership and management and governance, I think all of that is going to move to the source. Yeah. Um, and we see it happening in other industries like DevSecOps. So like so security and DevOps is already happening um, and kind of makes sense, right? It's really hard to do security management um, di being disconnected from the code. Same is true 
in data. So it's sort of like horseshoe theory, right? Like back in the eighties, the engineers, they, they, there was an engineering team and they did data. I Mm -hmm. think we're circling around back to that point. And um, I heard something cool the other day, which basically said that the closer you get to a customer, whether you're talking about code quality or data quality, the more expensive an issue becomes to resolve. So if I've shipped a new feature and that feature is in production and it's causing an outage or it's causing a bug on yeah. like my e-commerce website, that's really expensive for me to fix, right? If I catch that in CICD, so before it's deployed, mm-hmm. it's a lot less expensive, but even less expensive than that is if I catch it during the design phase. Yes. So when I'm actually writing that code. So I, I think everything is actually moving there. Right. Um, and I think AI is going to be used to basically understand in real time, how is the code that we are writing going to affect yeah. our existing production system? And when that happens, my view is that you're going to get a complete bifurcation of the tools. You're mm. going to see a lot of stuff kind of on either side where there'll be a lot sort of at the source and there'll be a lot at the destination. And the stuff at the destination will be figuring out, you know, what was the business impact of the changes that we made and starting yeah. to get really, really smart about how we, uh, h- how, how we do analysis on that. And then on the other side, it's all going to be about quality um, and, and getting as, as close getting quality as close as we can to the the actual code designers spending more time on useful things i love it i, I, I love the well, i love i love that kind of vision for the future that it, it enables that rather than having to spend so much time in the weeds and just constantly pruning and never never necessarily you know growing in your garden um gosh that's so interesting you are prolific out there with your writing with 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 uh your thought leadership um if folks want to connect with you how how can they do that um, the best way is to look me up on LinkedIn. It's just Chad Sanderson on LinkedIn. I'm probably going to be the first person that comes up. I love talking to folks there. Um, you can also follow my Substack, um, which is uh, the Data Products Substack. Uh, feel free to connect with me and send me a message. Um, yeah, those are the two best ways, I think. And, and I'll I'll go ahead and pitch the Data Quality Camp Slack oh, group. I just, I just joined it today. Uh, and I was just looking through some of the channels and I'm already like really excited to start uh, lurking a little bit more and maybe even joining the conversation. It's some, some good stuff there. So definitely join there. Awesome. So we we'll, we can throw some of those, uh, those links in the, uh, the episode notes as well. So check them out there. Absolutely. All right. We'd like to end uh, each podcast, Chad, with an incremental insight, a little tidbit that our listeners can walk away with and think I got value out of this. Uh, podcast today, uh, which I'm sure they already have to this point, but let's give oh, them a absolutely. little bit of a little bit extra. Do you have a, a, a resource, an article, a, blo- a blo- blogcast? <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> Podcast or blog? What's something that uh, that you have in mind that would be useful for our listeners? I do. So um, the one of the articles, you know, not to be egotistical, but it's something that I wrote along with some of my colleagues um, from Convoy. It's all about data contracts. It's called the rise of data contracts. You can find it on my Substack. And in that article, we lay out the full history of how we winded up in this point in data management. Like, right? why is this even something that we need to talk about? Why is it necessary? How do you implement it? And how did it work at Convoy? It, it basically covers uh, even more detail than we covered, uh, than we talked about in the podcast today. And I, I recommend folks take a read. Excellent. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, uh, when, the, uh, when the world of data quality and I guess data swamps get you down, it's time to measure up. <laughs>